good morning and welcome to the Norfolk Society of Arts first lecture of the 2020-2021 lecture series. My name is Jan Bradley. It's my pleasure to serve as president of NSA. I'm speaking to you from the Kaufman Theater at the Chrysler Museum, but it is certainly not business as usual. The COVID-19 virus has changed our way of life. I'm not seeing your smiling faces and enjoying our delicious reception and wonderful in-person speakers. Instead, this fall will be a virtual presentation with live question and answers. Please know that if guidelines change, we will reevaluate our schedule. I hope you all received your membership invitation in the mail earlier this month. If you did not receive the invitation and would like to join, please visit our website at NorfolkSocietyOfArts.org. Your membership enables us to bring you the world-class speakers each year. We thank you for your support. Today, we are happy to have Peter J. Schertz as our speaker. Dr. Schertz is the Jack and Mary Ann Frabel Curator of Ancient Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts a position he has held since 2006. Dr. Schertz received his PhD in classical art and archeology span from the University of Southern California and his BA in classical languages and literature from the University of Chicago. Among his projects at the VMFA include an in-depth study of the museum statue of Caligula, including a digital reconstruction of the statue's original colors, as well as the exhibition and catalog, The Horse in Ancient Greek Art. He has also published on the Temple of Herod in Jerusalem and the Ark of Titus in Rome. Today, Dr. Schertz will speak to us about his most recent exhibition at the VMFA, Treasures of Ancient Egypt, Sunken Cities. This program has been organized by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and is supported in part by the Paul Mellon Endowment and Gene Stafford Camp Memorial Fund. And now from Richmond, we are pleased to welcome Dr. Peter Schultz. Hi, my name is Peter Justin Moon Schultz and I'm the Jack and Marion Curator of Ancient Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. And I'm here to tell you about our major exhibition for the fall. It's began open on July 1st. It's called Treasures of Ancient Egypt, Sunken Cities, and it's at the museum until January 18th, 2021. I know many of you will be nervous about coming to the museum. I don't blame you, but the museum has put in place a lot of protocols to make our visitors and our staff feel safe. Masks are mandatory. Social distancing is required. Um, because this is a pay ticketed exhibition with timed entrances, we encourage everyone to make a reservation online that will allow you to have contactless entry to the exhibition. And of course, means by making it ahead of time, you won't come to the museum and discover that we're sold out. Again, as part of our safety protocols, we have capped entry to the exhibition at 75 people per hour. That's less than 25% of what we would normally of, of a normal capacity, which is about 100 people every 15 minutes. So again, we want people to feel safe, but if you're unable to feel safe, hopefully this lecture will give you a taste of the exhibition. It includes a lot of installation photography, as well as images of specific works in the exhibition. And you can see from that initial image on my title slide, it's a bunch of divers, and the title is Sunken Cities. So one of the themes for this exhibition is underwater archaeology. And how does this material get to be underwater? How does it get to be back on the surface? And we'll watch a little movie in a couple of minutes about that. But I'd like to show you one of the most amazing works in the exhibition. It's almost 18 feet tall, weighs about 13,000 pounds, 
with its stone infrastructure, with his steel infrastructure rather. You can see where he's been broken. And he's an Egyptian god called Happy. Happy is the god of the Nile inundation, the annual flood of the Nile, upon which the wealth of ancient Egypt relied. He's a beautiful statue. He's the largest statue of an Egyptian god ever discovered. And he's standing there in her atrium holding an offering tray, which I like to think of as the exhibition itself. And he's extending this offering tray to our visitors. Before I get into the real exhibition, the real meat of the exhibition, I just wanted to review a little bit about ancient Egypt. It is a kingdom in antiquity that arises in the northeast corner of Africa. It is one of the oldest civilizations of ancient Africa and one of the oldest complex civilizations in the world. Egypt develops along the Nile River. You can see through this map that there's an eastern desert and a western desert, very sparsely in Habited, very harsh conditions. So the civilization really is just where the Nile River provides fertility, a place to grow food. And at the north end of the Nile, and remember the Nile flows from south to north, unlike rivers in America like the Mississippi, at the north end of the Nile, the Nile expands into a delta, the Nile Delta, kind of like the Mississippi expands into the Mississippi Delta with a lot of the same effects. So the soil where the river meets the Mediterranean Sea isn't really that stable because it's just deposits over the decades, over the centuries, the millennia of dirt. So it's unstable soil. But in antiquity, two great cities were built on that unstable soil, Thonis or Aklion and Canopus. Those cities are now beneath the waters of the Mediterranean and modern Abu Kher Bay, and this exhibition is fine as brought to the surface from it. So I thought I'd show you a six-minute film that's the introductory film for the exhibition. When you make your tickets reservations online, you will receive a link to the film, but you'll also be able to see it in the exhibition or just outside the entrance to the exhibition. <laughs> How does a once dynamic and diverse metropolis disappear? How does a thriving and prosperous cultural center vanish from the face of the earth? Historical references describe an ancient Egyptian city that once commanded the attention of the world, only to slip into obscurity for centuries, completely forgotten until now. Off the coast of Egypt, the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology is conducting earth-shattering research. Frank Godio leads a team of underwater archaeologists at the Institute. In 1992, they began an ambitious research project to survey the ancient sunken city of Alexandria and to explore the waters to the east, an area known today as Abu Kir Bay. After spending years mapping huge tracts of seabed, they made an incredible discovery. Beneath the Mediterranean waters, only a few miles east of Egypt's second largest city, lay a sunken world of temples and hieroglyphs, shipwrecks and sanctuaries. It was the discovery of two ancient Egyptian cities, Thonis Heraklion and Canopus. Work in the bay was challenging, visibility was poor, and the hours were long. New scientific techniques were developed, and a unique and intensive survey-based approach was employed for mapping the bottom of the sea. And the discoveries were astonishing. Ancient Egyptian and Greek sources speak of two different cities, the Egyptian city of Thonis and the Greek city of Heraklion. Early evidence indicated that they had found the exact location of the city Heraklion. But as work would continue, 
they would soon solve a centuries-long historical mystery. Among the underwater treasures discovered at the site of Heraklion was a stele, an ancient stone tablet pristinely preserved. The stele features text that specifically mentions its location, the Egyptian city of Thonis. This led Godio and the researchers to the groundbreaking discovery that what was once believed to be two cities, Thonis and Heraklion, was in fact a single city. Other artifacts give us a clearer picture of what kind of city Thonis Heraklion actually was, the premier port in Egypt and a center for trade with the Mediterranean and world beyond. Excavations have uncovered 75 ships and more than 700 anchors, medals, pottery, statuettes, and coins from across the Mediterranean. This city was home to a diverse population. In addition to this maritime and economic activity, Godio and his team discovered evidence of the thriving religious life in this cosmopolitan city. At the center of it all was a monumental temple to Amun Gera, a holy place where pharaohs were required to visit to complete their ascension to the throne. Colossal statues, votive offerings, and ritual vessels reveal details of the inner workings of these sacred spaces and the mysterious ceremonies that were celebrated there. Perhaps the most significant discovery is what we now understand about ancient Egypt's most important religious celebration, the mysteries of Osiris. Until now, our limited knowledge was based mainly on temple and tomb carvings, but the findings at Thonis Heraklion have shed new light on the Osirian mysteries. Artifacts reveal previously secret aspects of the ceremony, and portions of the mysteries are documented by hundreds of recently discovered objects of personal devotion. In Thonis Heraklion, the multi-day ceremony came to an end with a sacred boat voyage to the neighboring city of Canopus. Canopus was an important city in its own right. Famous for its sanctuary dedicated to the god Serapis, people from all over the world came here in search of miraculous healing. The temple was demolished in the fourth century AD and its statues, altars, and shrines were destroyed, dumped, and buried. But how do two cities of such grandeur and cultural importance quietly disappear? How does a society forget that they once existed? By 800 AD, the rising sea level, along with unstable soil and natural disasters, such as earthquakes and floods, had caused both Thonis Heraklion and the nearby community of Canopus to submerge into the Mediterranean. And their ruins would remain underwater, buried beneath the silt and sand for more than a thousand years. Godio and his team have been excavating these sites since their discovery close to 20 years ago. But just a small fraction, roughly 10% of their treasures, has been fully unearthed. Only time will tell of the groundbreaking discoveries yet to come. Okay. So, how does do objects, nearly 300 objects, that were once in the Mediterranean Sea make their way from being underwater and all the way to Virginia. Well, Frank Godio and the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology, the organizers for the exhibition, made it possible, of course. But then inside the museum, we had to figure out how do we fit that amount of material into a 12,000 square foot exhibition space. And just by way of comparison, a recent exhibition on Edward Hopper 
used the same 12,000 square feet foot space and had 80, ob 80 objects. So, you know, kind of a big difference, right? We begin with our plan and it has all of the charm and all of the intimidating qualities of a blank sheet of paper inserted into a typewriter. And you look at it and you think, if I make a mistake, what's going to happen? Unfortunately, all that happens is we start over again on the computer or a new printout of it. Um, but it's still a little a little bit weird. It's, it is like the blank sheet of paper on a typewriter. And this is the plan that we developed. Daniel Young of our design department, working with me, working with Courtney Murano, our head of interpretation, and a team of other people, including graphic designers and editors. We came up with a plan that has an introductory section and a theater we can watch the video that we just watched, carefully spaced out chairs, so, you know, for people to feel safe. And from the introduction, we go into time, because I think that that helps orient people. There's a lot of unfamiliar things about ancient Egypt and about the, these topics, like the mysteries of Osiris. So anything we can do to help people feel more comfortable, we did including telling them, explaining to them about the time period. I'll get to that in a minute. Then place, what were these cities? Thonos, Heraklion, why do they matter? What was going on in them more than 2000 years ago? And because so much of the exhibition concerns the mysteries of Osiris that were referenced in the film, the next section is about religion to set up that exploration of the mysteries of Osiris. And then we kind of come back to time with the cults of Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt. Most of the material in the exhibition dates from the Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt. And part of what's going on in that period is a period of tremendous change, but also continuity in ancient Egypt. So we sort of come full circle from time to Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt. This is an installation photograph of the introductory section. There are videos on the wall. These are, obviously this is a still, but these are actual videos that provide atmosphere about underwater archeology. span There's an explanation for underwater archeology, span how it differs from land archeology. span and in the center of the space, there's a single object called the Naos of the Decades. Naos is a Greek word that means shrine. And this shrine, this Naos, once held a cult image of a god called Shu. He was an early Egyptian creator god. We decided to begin with this object for a number of reasons. First of all, the top which is a reproduction of the top. The original top is in the Louvre. It was found in the 1770s, so 250 years ago almost. They found the top of this nose, and it was the first clue that something important once stood in this part of the Egyptian coast. Other parts of the shrine were found in the 1930s, and yet more of it was discovered in the 1990s, I can see there's still a bit of it missing here and here. Who knows? Those may be found this year. They're still excavating. Or they may be found next year. Or they may never be found. But we have most of the shrine. And an important, in addition to it being important for our knowledge that these cities existed in this region, it's also important because on the exterior, they're relief carvings of an Egyptian sacred calendar in which the year is divided into 36 decades, 36 10 day periods, each governed by a configuration of stars named the Deccan stars. And it's one of the most important ancient calendars to survive from ancient Egypt and records the taking, but in the month of Koyak, a festival called 
as they call it, festival today of the Mysteries of Osiris took place. So it's an important object also for the rest of the exhibition. The exhibition itself, as I mentioned, begins with an attempt to orient people in terms of time. Most of the material in the exhibition dates to the late period, which is the last phase of Egyptian rule over and the country until the modern period. The late period begins with Dynasty 25, when Somtek I expels the Nubians who have conquered Egypt. The Nubians live in the south of Egypt and modern day Sudan. They are a civilization that grows up in conjunction with Egypt, sometimes in competition, sometimes alongside and separately. Sometimes they're conquered by the Egyptians, sometimes they've conquered Egypt. So it's a really interesting dynamic there. But when the Nubians are expelled in 664, Zomtek I establishes the dynasty, lasts for a couple, about 150 years till he's, the Persians occupy Egypt. They set up a dynasty. And the Egyptians and Persians alternate rule over Egypt until the year 323, when Alexander the Great, 332, I'm sorry, when Alexander the Great conquers Egypt as part of his campaigns against the Persian Empire. Alexander dies in 323, and his commander, Ptolemy I, sets up a dynasty that rules over Egypt for the next 300 years. His dynasty comes to an end in the year 30, when Cleopatra VII, the famous Cleopatra from Shakespeare, when Cleopatra VII loses a military campaign against Octavian, the future Roman Emperor Augustus, and commits suicide. And then Egypt is part of the Roman Empire until the Muslim conquest in 640. But the exhibition essentially ends with the outlawing of the pagan cults by the Roman Emperor Theodosius I, whose center is in Constantinople, modern day modern day Istanbul, once also known as Byzantium, but Theodosius I outlaws the worship of the pagan gods in 391. So this exhibition is about the last millennia of the pre-Christian world, in effect, in the Mediterranean. This image is fascinating because one of the things that's happening in the Ptolemaic period is a mixture of Greek and Egyptian artistic and intellectual cultures, and religious cultures for that matter. Very deliberately, the Ptolemies are trying to create a hybrid civilization that they, as Macedonian Greeks and their Egyptian supporters and subjects, can both get behind. So the statue that you see here is just a beautiful statue of a Ptolemaic queen, just as Isis, you can see that she's very rigid, very stiff. That's typical of Egyptian art. Her hands are held closely to her side. Her arms have not be free, been freed from her body. There is stone still connecting the arms to her body. There's a pillar behind her, all of which are really typical aspects of Egyptian depictions of queens. But it's also a Greek sculpture. This way of doing the drapery, the swallowtail drapery, is, this is a typical Greek hairstyle. And behind her, that pillar, it's unornamented. An Egyptian statue would have a pillar that would say, who is the queen? We don't know, as you can see from the title in our the slide, we don't know who the queen is. The Egyptians would have identified her and explained why she's being honored or where she's being honored. But the Greeks don't do that, but they keep the form of the pillar. And all of that form, all of the rigidity, the pillar, that's to convey a sense of stability, one of the major values of ancient Egyptian culture and art. As I said, this is the Ptolemaic period set up by Ptolemy I, one of Alexander's commanders. They have as their emblem an eagle, 
a bird sacred to the Greek god Zeus, and the Ptolemies claim that they are descended from Heracles, the son of Zeus. So they're very carefully trying to align themselves with the gods. Both of the statues that we just saw, where they're aligning with the Egyptian gods, as Egyptian rulers had been doing for millennia, and with the Greek gods through this image that associates Ptolemy I with the eagle of Zeus. This is an installation photograph showing the statue. She's about nine feet tall, and other objects in the time exhibition looking down the corridor to place. And that stelae that we saw in the film, the stelae of Thonus Heracleon, the stelae de dates to the 30th dynasty, the last native Egyptian dynasty to rule over Egypt until the modern period, and Nectanobo I is the man who established that dynasty, having expelled Persians. The stele itself is perfectly preserved, and it was deliberately preserved. When the archaeologists found it, it was covered in a layer of clay and, and lying face down in a temple, suggesting that priests had, to, had preserved it, which makes perfect sense when you read the actual inscription. What does the inscription say? The inscription says that Nectanobo I, by his decree, mandated that one-tenth of the tax revenues collected in the port of Thonis Heracleon would be used to support the Temple of Naith, in an Egyptian city further south on the Nile called Sais. And probably the priests in this temple wanted to preserve it in the hopes that after the Persians were expelled, the new pharaoh would continue that generosity to the temples. Unfortunately, it wasn't Egyptians who had spelled the Persians, it was Alexander the Great. Thonis Heracleon was a really cosmopolitan city. It was a port city. It was Egypt's major port on the, ex on the Mediterranean coast, and it attracted people from all over the Mediterranean, including from Italy, but also from Greece, also from Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and the selection of jewelry demonstrates some of those connections with the wider Mediterranean world. This earring is a Greek earring. This is a Roman style intaglio. This earring here is from the Near East. Interestingly, all of this was found in a temple, and what must have happened is ordinary people who came to this port city from all over the Mediterranean went and made offerings to the local god Amun Garib. And that tells us something about how ancient polytheism worked. Polytheists believe in many gods, and because of that belief, they're really flexible about honoring the gods of other peoples and other cultures. And if you were traveling, you wanted the local gods to be nice to you, especially if you were a merchant. So you would, you would make a vote of saying, Oh, please help me in this trade negotiation, or thank you so much for helping me arrive to this new place safely. That's essentially what votives do. It's a really interesting part of Egypt at this time, though. And while this particular example is in another section of the exhibition, the section on religion, it's a fascinating work because it's the same story. It's a story of how ancient polytheists were flexible. You can't really see it here, but there's a Phoenician inscription saying that this monument was dedicated by a Phoenician, Paul Astarte, in Egypt to an Egyptian god. The god is, is Horus. This is a healing dedication. You would pour water over the top of it. Horus has subjected really powerful animals. There are magical inscriptions around here. The water would flow over the stele, gather powers from the inscriptions and from Horus and from the powerful animals he subdued, and the water would gather in this basin where you could scoop it up and consume it or apply it to your body and add healing qualities. But again, it's the Phoenician dedicating 
a monument to an Egyptian god. One of the most important gods in Phonus Heracleum, in fact, the most important god, is Amun. Amun is an ancient early Egyptian god who was especially important to the Nubians, who had conquered Egypt just before the late period in Dynasty 25. Late, the late period, Samtik I expels the Nubians, but he continues to give high honors to Amun. And in Phonus Heraklion, the principal temple, which you see in this photo reconstruction of the city, the principal temple is dedicated to Amun Gerib. Next to that temple is a smaller temple to Amun's son, Kansu the Child. As the film indicated, one of the reasons this temple is important is that every new pharaoh, in order to begin his reign, comes to this temple and receives divine favor, sanction for his rule. So in terms of dynastic succession, this temple is really important. So next to it, we show this ensemble, two works of art that refer to the pharaoh. One of them, I love this image because it's a falcon with a pharaoh between his feet and an attitude of prayer. That falcon is the Egyptian god Horus, who can take the form of a falcon, but the pharaoh is the living incarnation of Horus on earth. So here you have the god Horus protecting the pharaoh, and what's really going on here is a wonderful mind game, because Horus Horus is protecting the pharaoh, who is in an attitude of prayer. The pharaoh is Horus, and he's praying to himself. Um, you know, this image of the human pharaoh is praying to Horus, the god, and Horus, the god, is protecting himself by protecting the pharaoh. Right in front of it is another statue of a pharaoh, a standing figure, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about this label and this image. I'm not going to read the label to you. You can read it. But if you'd notice, it's a differently written label than most museum labels. Working with our head of interpretation, Courtney Murano, I wanted to experiment with a label that's teaching people how to read an Egyptian statue, that's getting them more involved and actively looking, rather than just informing our audience through the label, this is the Kepkrish crown, this is the Shendit. I wanted to get people to actively look and teach them how to look at an Egyptian statue. Next to that display is another Naos, the third Naos in the exhibition. This Naos is associated with Khonsu the child, the son of Amun. And next to that Naos is a display about Khonsu the child that includes this foundation deposit. A foundation deposit was placed uh, beneath the floor of a temple and it was meant to ensure the longevity, the stability of the temple. And the foundation deposit includes a number of objects, including the statuette of Khonsu the Child. In his typical pose, you can just barely see it here, but he's holding his finger up to his lips, and a wooden nose. So even if this nose had disappeared in antiquity, which eventually it did, Kansu was able to inhabit this temple because he had a home in the form of a shrine here and a statue in which to embody himself. The last object I'd like to talk about in terms of place is the statue of a queen found in the city of Canopus, the city nearby Thonus Heraklion where the mysteries of Osiris culminate. This statue is thought to be Arsinoe II, and just like that unknown queen I talked about before who was dressed as Isis, it's a beautiful, stunning combination of Greek and Egyptian art. You can see how the statue's composition is a little bit looser than the Black Queen, the queen of dressed as Isis, her foot is extended, there's a little more give in her left arm, but her right arm, which still fully survives, is still attached to her body. 
Her garment is in a wet drapery style, pioneered in Greece and the classical period, but it's tied with something called the Isis knot. So again, it's this amazing combination that was happening in Ptolemaic Egypt of the encounter between Greek and Egyptian artistic traditions. I'd like to move on now to our fourth section. So the fourth part of the exhibition explores Egyptian religion. And the focus of this exploration, although it talks about other gods, is primarily on the gods Osiris and his sister wife, Isis, both of whom are shown here in these enthroned statues, meaning that they're seated, that were found in tombs in other region in another part of Egypt. Osiris and Isis form part of what's called the Osirian Triad, with their son Horus, whom I've talked about before. Remember, Horus take, can take the form of a falcon or of a small child with the typical braided um, kind of hair knot of children in ancient Egypt. A triad is simply a group of three gods. It's one of the fundamental ways Egyptians organized their religion. There are a number of these father, mother, child triads in, in ancient Egypt. And as you can see, these are not great statues. And it's one of the actually, to me, one of the great things about the exhibition. This isn't high art, but there are a lot of indications of the piety of everyday prosperous, but not incredibly wealthy Egyptians. So within this section, we also have this display of various gods, but especially Osiris and Isis. Um, and again, these are not high art. This is just how a wealthy person could express their piety towards the gods. This section also has one of my favorite works in the exhibition, the statue of Tawarit. Tawarit is a goddess who protects women in childbirth, also probably young children, but especially women in childbirth. And if you look at the statue, you'll notice that her body and limbs are those of a lion. Her head is the head of a hippopotamus. And you can barely see a bit of her tail down here. That's the tail of a crocodile. So this goddess is being depicted as a sort of melange of different animals. And I think that there's a reason for that. Many, many, many women must have died in childbirth in antiquity. They were dying in childbirth up until pretty recent times. What were killing these women? It's invisible things often, germs and illnesses that can't be, aren't visible to the human eye. And what better to invite to fight off invisible powers than a creature that doesn't exist in this realm? So I think that's probably why to where it has such an odd configuration of animals. It's a really, I mean, I hate to say this about it, a goddess whose job is to ward off evil and be fierce, but she's a really cute statue. <laughs> At the end of the exploration of Egyptian religion, we have this image, and it's the transition to the mysteries of Osiris because it really explains the myth of Osiris. Osiris is the first king of Egypt. He is the oldest child of Geb and Nath, and he has three siblings, Isis, whom he marries, his brother Seth, and Nephthys. Seth is a jealous brother. This whole myth is, would be a wonderful soap opera of family dysfunction. Um, Seth is a jealous brother, and he wants to be ruler, so he traps Osiris into a box and hides the box. But Isis finds it and lets her husband out. Seth, in rage, rips Osiris into 14 pieces and scatters the pieces across the earth. Isis, however, ever the loyal wife and sister, gathers the pieces. She wraps them in linen. 
and then using her magic, and Isis is a goddess closely associated with magic by the Egyptians, she turns herself into a kite, a kind of bird of prey, and uses her wings to beat the breath of life into Osiris. Osiris comes alive in this realm just long enough to impregnate Isis before he recedes and he becomes the ruler of the netherworld in ancient Egypt. Isis eventually gives birth to Horus, who grows up and avenges his father, expels Seth, who is the god of chaos, and rules on earth as Osiris's heir. And from that time, the living pharaoh is identified with Horus, but when the pharaoh dies, he goes into the underworld and he becomes identified with Osiris. That myth of Osiris is essentially a myth of a god who dies and is reborn. And when you think about the natural world, that model of death and rebirth is repeated everywhere, and the Egyptians see it's repeated. What happens with the day? The life-giving sun emerges at dawn, and the life-giving sun recedes at sunset, and then it's night and darkness and the time of chaos. But the next day, the dawn is, comes back. What happens with the year? Days grow shorter, they grow longer. The year lives and dies. What happens in Egypt, totally dependent on the annual flood of the Nile? The waters come, they deposit fertile soil on the banks of the river. You pl plant your seeds, they grow, you harvest them, and the land dies again till the next cycle of renewal. And that's what the mysteries of Osiris are meant to ensure. And that's the most important set of finds archaeologically, intellectually, that Godio has found are associated with the mysteries of Osiris. The mysteries take place primarily in the temples, so only the, temp the priests know what's happening. The Egyptian population can't go into the temples. And the priests make these images called the Osiris Vegetons figure. They do it by taking silk from the Nile, mixing it with barley seeds, and setting that mixture into golden molds. Once the material has set and come, become hard, they take it out of the molds and they wrap it in linen like this figure. This figure also has a wax head in the form of Osiris. And they take that figure and they put it in a basin. And then they water it. Obviously what happens, the seeds that are in the silk get watered and they germinate. And this is a harbinger of a good crop in the coming year. In our installation of these objects, we created this wonderful view of the corn mummy, or grain mummy as it's sometimes called, the Osiris figure, the basin, and a reproduction of a graphic from an ancient temple that shows somebody watering the Osiris Vegetons figure. Within the section, we also have objects that were used to make the Osiris Vegetons and a second figure of Osiris called Osiris Sokar, also made at the same time of year. A third case, and I just want to talk about this briefly because it's a wonderful story about the creativity and skill of a scholar, Emile Chassanet, Long before Godio's excavations in Thonis Heraklion and Canopus, Chassanet studied all of the ancient texts and drawings about the mysteries of Osiris. And he hypothesized these are the implements, the ritual implements used in making the figures. And he drew what he thought they would look like. And what's great about Godio's excavations is he found a lot of those implements and they often correspond almost exactly to what Chassanet thought they would look like. So the making of the figures takes place in secret, but then the figures get carried from Thonis Heraklion to Canopus, and they get carried in a sacred boat. 
In the film, we saw that Godio mentioned that he had found 75 boats in his excavations. Only one of them is made out of sycamore wood, this one. He excavated the boat, but did not bring it to the surface, so it's still underwater. But what's interesting about it is not only is it made from sycamore, the wood sacred to the god Osiris, a wood native to ancient Egypt, the boat was deliberately sunk. Planks were removed right here. And why was it sunk? Because it was probably used to carry these images from Thonis Heraklion, these sacred images of the god. Remember, the image is the god itself. It's not a depiction of the god. There's really no difference to the ancient mind between an image of a god and the god itself. The god is always able to inhabit that image. So this boat belonged to Osiris because it was used to carry him. And because it belonged to Osiris, once it could no longer serve its function, it had to be ritually destroyed. So they destroy it by taking out the planks and sinking it. As part of that festival of carrying the figures, ordinary Egyptians are able to gather on the banks of the waterways connecting these two cities and make offerings to the god in these stone offering dishes. These ladles, dozens of ladles, have been found in the waters between these cities, and they were dedications by people expressing their piety, expressing their belief in Osiris, and asking Osiris for a good harvest in the coming year. Other objects found in the waterway include these lead boats. You can see that several of them have been deliberately distorted. That was done in antiquity, again, because you gave this as a vote of dedication to Osiris, and once it was given to Osiris, then it had to be taken out of the human realm. So you deliberately destroyed it and cast it into the waters. This is just another installation photograph of that area of the exhibition. You can see there are lamps here. One of the navigations, one of the maritime processions from Thonis Heraklion to Tenothis took place at night. And the boats were lit by 365 lamps, one for each day of the Egyptian year. You can just barely see them here, but there are bells. This is a lively festival. They're singing and praying and music and incense is being burnt to fill the air with beautiful smells pleasing to the gods. Thousands of people must have been gathered here. It must have been an amazing sight to experience. Now, the last room in the gallery explores the cults of Ptolemaic and Roman Egypt, the last two phases of polytheism in ancient Egypt before Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. And I'd like to talk especially about this image. It's a wooden cult image. The wood is sycamore. The images of a god named Serap is a fascinating god whom Ptolemy I literally invented. Ptolemy has a dilemma. He's a Macedonian Greek. He has a few thousand Macedonian Greeks with him. And he's supposed to rule this entire Nile Valley, this ancient kingdom of Egypt that has a vast population and vast wealth. How does he do it? Sometimes he just uses flat out military force to suppress any dissent. He works closely with the local aristocracy and priests of Egypt to get them to support him. And he creates a symbol that everybody in his kingdom can worship. He creates the symbol of a new god called Serapis. Serapis combines elements of Greek gods and elements of Egyptian gods, both conceptually and in the imagery. You can see it on this piece, but other depictions of Serapis in the exhibition have a modius on his head, a colophos, and the Greek word modius is Latin. And it's a grain basket specific to Egypt, and it's a symbol of Egypt's abundance, so it's sort of like a cornucopia. This type of hair and beard, that is a typical way that the Greeks show 
the god Zeus, the principal god of the Greek pantheon, but also Zeus's brothers, Poseidon, god of the sea, and Hades, god of the underworld and of wealth. Serapis becomes the patron god of Alexandria, a port city. So a reference to Poseidon makes sense, but so does a reference to Hades, a god of wealth. But what's interesting is Hades is also the god of the Egyptian, of the Greek underworld, the land of the dead, and therefore is similar to Osiris, who was the ruler of the Egyptian land of the dead. But Osiris is also a fertility god associated with the mysteries of Osiris. And what's fertility in terms of grain production? But wealth. So Osiris and Hades are intertwined in a number of ways. The name Serapis is a combination of the name Osiris and another early Greek, early Egyptian god named Apis, whom I will talk about in a moment. This wooden image as a cult image, as I said, very unusual. And in the exhibition, we show it alongside a second cult image, also of wood, of Osiris. They're wonderful to behold, partly because they have a lot of traces of the ancient paint used to decorate them. So you can see the pinkish red here, the blue on here, and the gold on the face of this statue of Osiris. Ancient images, ancient statues were always colorful. They're not just white marble the way we are used to seeing them in museums, but they had a number of colors to bring them alive, to give them lifelike qualities, including, you can see here, Osiris's eyes. I'll talk briefly about these because they're wonderful objects. They come from a single temple that was built as a private dedication on the road from Alexandria to Canopus. The temple has been reconstructed. You'll notice that these are all white stone. They're marble. Egypt has no source of marble. The stone had to be imported at great expense. Sorry. But what's interesting is their inscription records the dedication by a man named Isidorus. He was thrown from his chariot and he survived. He kept the use of his feet. So he dedicated a statue to a god he only identifies as the blessed, Makarios. But these images that he included in his temple are a form of Osiris invented in the Roman period called Osiris Hydraeus. And what's cool about it is this is a Roman form of Osiris on a wall fresco found in Herculaneum, one of the cities destroyed in the year 79 by the explosion of Vesuvius. It's a scene of an Egyptian temple with Egyptian priests who can be identified by their bald head. They were ritually purified by shaving all the hair from their body. This priest up here is holding an Osiris Hydraeus figure. The last statue I want to talk about is an Apis bull. So if Serapis and Osiris Hydraeus are examples of innovation within the framework of Egyptian religion, Apis is a sign of continuity. Apis is worshipped from the beginning of dynastic Egyptian history around the year 3100 BCE. And the statue is dedicated by the Roman Emperor Hadrian in the second century of our era. So the Roman Emperor is worshipping an Egyptian god from 3,000 years earlier. Remember, we're only 2,000 years removed from Hadrian. So Sir Apis was already 1,000 years older than in terms of chronology thousand years older from Hadrian than we are from Hadrian. It's a remarkable sign of continuity and antiquity. It's a beautiful statue. It's about two meters tall and two meters long. And it comes right at the end of our installation of the exhibition. So the last image I want to show you is just a new god just invented at the VMFA. This is a cutout of one of the statues in the exhibition. We had to remade it in order to develop lighting for that statue. 
and somebody put up a mask on it. So I decided this is Osiris Pandeos, the Osiris who will protect us from a pandemic. I urge all of you to come, and I can't wait till the question and answer period. Thank you so much. Hi, so that was recorded, and now I'm live, and I'm eager to answer any questions you might have about the exhibition or the museum during the pandemic. Peter, it's Jan, and we have some questions from our viewers, and I want to thank you for agreeing to answer their questions. The first question comes from one of the docents at the Chrysler Museum. Are the artifacts that are found in the underwater city of Heraklion, for example, belong to Egypt? Or is there some kind of arrangement between the discoverer and the country where the artifacts are found? Um, so the question is referring to an old model of archaeological investigation where the discoveries were divided between the excavator or excavators and the national government. These days, virtually, well, every archaeological excavation that I know of, including um, Godio's, all of the finds belong to the Egyptian state. So most of them are housed in a museum of about underwater archaeology on the Mediterranean coast of Egypt. Okay, our second question uh, comes from one of the NSA board members. How long do the items recovered from the underwater excavations have to be treated or cured out of the water before they can be displayed? That is a question that makes me wish I were a conservator <laughs> because I just don't have enough science background or knowledge of that process. I know it can take it depends on the material, of course. Um, um, you're in Norfolk. Some of you may be following the restoration and preservation and restoration of the USS Monitor at the Maritime Museum. And that's a project that's gone on for years and there will be years ahead of it. You have to completely desalinate the object. So with metals and woods, that can be a very long process, a very involved process. That boat that I showed, the picture of the boat that's in the corridor with the Mysteries of Osiris, the boat was excavated, but they did not raise it to the surface because it would have been, the wood is too delicate and it would have been too costly and time consuming to try to preserve it and too risky, to be honest. So I don't have a precise answer but it is a very, very labor intensive process. Uh, another question that came in, was Egyptian culture merging with a Greek culture at the time of these lost cities? And was the art still meant for spiritual purposes and the afterlife or influenced by Greek philosophies? Um, there are, having started out in classical literature as an undergrad, there are many, many, many debates about the actual influence of Greek philosophy on really anything, but especially art. You know, Plato saying that poets should be banned in the ideal city never happened in Greece. Um, and this merging of artistic forms, um, there was still a tremendously important spiritual life. It's not the spiritual life that we think about generally, but um, piety was a, one of the most important virtues and characteristics of a good person in antiquity and expressing that piety. So what's important to remember, I think, with a lot of these statues, especially the innovations, the invention of Serapis, the Roman form of Osiris Hydraeus is that um, we tend to think about religion as being pretty static. When you look at the arc of any religion, whether it's 
a monotheistic religion, whether it's a polytheistic system, um, it adapts to the times and people's, you know, people change over time. They have different needs. They need different things from their religions. So religion is always evolving. It's not the static thing that many of us think of it as being. Prayers that were said 100 years ago, 200 years ago, may not respond to our needs today. So we don't say them often. So, you know, one of the great themes of the exhibition really is change and continuity. Apis is an example of continuity. So Apis is of change. So, um, yes, I, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Uh, another question. Since so many treasures were found, do you think the cities had a catastrophic end or event that made the inhabitants abandon the objects? So the ground and the Nile and the Nile Delta, when it meets the Mediterranean, is very unstable. So we know within a couple of hundred years, so about 500, 400 BCE, we already know that parts of Thonus Heraklion had to be abandoned because the soil was subsiding, the soil was sinking into the sea. But new formations of soil were being created, so they built new temples on the new land. By the time these cities sank, about 1,200 years ago, they had been largely abandoned because remember, first of all, Thonus Heraklion as a port had become secondary with the creation of Alexandria, probably the largest and greatest port of the ancient Mediterranean. And the religious functions of these cities was violently suppressed by the early Christians by, you know, circa 391, when Theodosius outlaws the worship of pagan cults. We know a number of this cult statues in Canopus were systematically broken and cast into the waters. Um, so they had been largely abandoned, although there were, we know that there were Christian monasteries. And again, in the eighth century, uh, there seems to have been a cataclysmic climate event, probably an earthquake combined with a flood. And if you remember, there was that hurricane a few years ago that just dumped day after day rain onto North Carolina. And if you remember the photographs, you could see buildings literally just sinking into that soil. When that flood came in, that's what happened to the soil. It filled the soil with water and the temples, which were made out of stone, sank. The housing was probably mud brick, that's standard in ancient Egypt. And of course, that rarely survives in any environment, certainly not in a wet, humid environment like the, like the Nile Delta. Another question, do we know when this city became submerged? So about 800, and we have documentary evidence of an earthquake, I forget what year, it may have been 837. Um, of a major earthquake that was big enough that people wrote about it. So about 1200 years ago. Okay, our final question, Peter. Are there any other underwater areas in the Mediterranean ready to be investigated for possible artifacts? Um, underwater archaeology is really, really taking off in a big way these days. So all across the Mediterranean, there are divers um, off of sort of off the coast of Italy towards of Sicily and Italy. They've been investigating the site of a major, these are just things I happen to know about, investigating a major naval battle between Carthage and Rome that occurred in, I believe, 241 BCE. In Istanbul, they found the old port, the early port, with literally dozens of shipwrecks there. On the coast of Greece, they've been looking for 
the naval battle of Salamis and another naval battle between the Persian and the Greek fleets that took place during the Persian Wars. Um, major finds have been discovered off of the coast of Israel also. So really all across the Mediterranean, underwater archaeology has been occurring. Peter, thank you so much for answering questions from our viewers. We really appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thank you to our speaker, Peter Schertz. Please do not forget this exhibition is open until January 18th. Our speaker for October will be Melissa Kahn, Director, Venice Office, Save Venice Incorporated. Some of you may recall Melissa Kahn was scheduled to speak to us last March, but due to the COVID-19 closures, her talk was canceled. We feel very fortunate that we are able to host her this year. We are looking forward to having her and hope you will join us. Please note that this lecture will be Wednesday, October 14th. Remember, you can always find information on the speakers and upcoming lectures on our NSA website, Facebook page, and Instagram. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next month.